Okay, everyone, welcome to one of the last lectures of the course, and I'm going to keep this one um, pretty short. I just want to try to look at some of the things that are in this last chapter, um, connect them to um, some of the things that we've talked about over the last few weeks, and then end with um, some questions that might help us um, answer one of, the, um, one of the study guide questions. So the big thing I want to focus on um, in this last lecture and connecting it back to some things we've talked about recently um, is let's, let's pull the war on terror out of that last chapter that we read and try to contextualize it um, a little bit. And one thing I want you to think about is that you know before 9-11, Terrorism and war um, were two problems that were really kind of disconnected from each other. They, they required completely different responses. Um, if you think about um, one of the, the, the worst acts of terrorism in the United States in 1995, not far from us um, in Lubbock in Oklahoma City. Right, Oklahoma City bombing, 1995, kills 168 people. No one at that time was necessarily saying that there is a, a war um, to be fought against terrorism, right? And terrorism has a long history in the United States. It's not like 9-11 is the first um, major act of terrorism. It's not like the Oklahoma City bombing is the first act of terrorism in the United States. Um, in, in the U.S. in response to terrorism, uh, the perpetrators have been um, sought after, they've been arrested, uh, they've been tried, and they've been punished through um, the American court system. It hasn't resulted in this kind of larger sense of uh, uh, a necessary war that needs to be fought. But 9-11 really changed that, and it really brought war and terror together, right? And so on September 11, uh, 12th, Right, the day after uh, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center and also the Pentagon, George W. Bush stands up um, and says, uh, the deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against the country were more um, than acts of terror, they were acts of war. Right? Remember, as, as we talked about you know, during the Cold War, that just by signaling that a war had begun, it has pretty major consequences, right? Um, it enhances presidential power. That's what's so key. Throughout the 20th century, when we've read about wars, we've, we've talked about, or, or at least we've read about, um, the enhancement of the executive branch, right? Curtailment of civil liberties, right? These are often justifications for um, executive power. And, and Americans have generally been um, okay with that or more tolerant of that, in part because they see war as an exceptional period in time, right, when there is some major crisis that needs to be dealt with, but also understanding that these are temporary um, periods of time, right, often very short periods of time when those things like civil liberties um, can be given up but will be given back um, to people, right, and so you know, we talked a little bit, bit about during the Cold War of this sort of ambiguity um, of the um, problem and also um, no really sense of, of when it ends, right? But let's, we'll come back to that in a second and let's just focus on much like during the Cold War, much like uh, during the, the wars that we've talked about so far, the War on Terror II has allowed for the expansion of executive power. And we saw that Right after 9-11, we see um, things like the Patriot Act, right, which authorized really broad government surveillance of American citizens, you know, passed by Congress. Um, it had both, you know, conservative uh, and a lot of liberal uh, support, too, right? In addition to the, the Patriot Act, uh, President Bush also authorized secret warrantless surveillance of Americans, telephones, uh, conversations, and email communications, um, allowing the National Security Agency to carry this out. And again, so when the Justice Department um, looks at this and tries to justify it, um, it argues that 
um, this sort, these sorts of acts by the executive branch um, are justified during wartime, right? If this was just a um, uh, a problem of, of terrorism in the United States, just kind of dealing with terrorism, those sorts of acts would not be allowed. But because this is a war on terrorism, right? This is wartime that those types of executive branch powers, um, the Justice Department thinks that they're, they're allowed. Wartime also allows the executive branch to kind of l interpret at the margins of what um, is allowed in terms of human rights, right? And, you know, the American public uh, has historically um, been more lenient about how the United States uh, treats um, enemies uh, during wartime than not during wartime. So this is why it's so significant of calling this a war on terror and not just the United States just trying to kind of combat terrorism, right? It, it's so significant to call something war. Um, and so let's, let's step back again and think about the links between the Cold War that we talked about recently and this war on terror. When thinking about um, you know the United States um, extending military action into uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, right, shows that the sort of conceptual conceptual lines um, are very much linked to the Cold War. It's a battle against an ideology that could be found anywhere around the globe, right, disconnected from any sort of nation state with no clear ending. And so uh, historian Mary Dudziak um, has a great quote about this that I'm just going to quote here, here. She says, like communism, the new kind of terrorism could pop up anywhere. Once the enemy was not a nation state or even an identifiable social group, but an ideology, war seemed to have no boundaries in space and time, but seeped into the global spaces where those evil ideas reside. So what I want you to kind of think about here, when we're analyzing kind of our own moment in time, um, is to think about how closely this looks to the Cold War, this period after World War II, this idea of kind of this endless war that we're living in, uh, where the executive branch can invoke um, very strong powers. And finally, I want us to use this final chapter and just think about some bigger questions that might help us um, a bit with the uh, final exam um, and the study guide. Uh, this final chapter covers um, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama. It doesn't yet cover Donald Trump, but think about Donald Trump. What I want you to think about, since this, this final exam is going to go from World War II to the present, um, is that think about which political ideology, liberalism or conservatism, has made a larger impact on American politics since World War II. Just think about this you know, last chapter of you know, what's going on here. Um, you have uh, the New Democrats, uh, Bill Clinton, um, which we talked about before looks almost kind of like a moderate conservative. You have George W. Bush, um, who um, has passed a lot of pieces of legislation, has led the United States into war. Uh, his policies are certainly conservative. Uh, and then we have Barack Obama, and we have pieces of legislation that are in your book, um, like the health care law that you know better as um, Obamacare, which perhaps doesn't really fit well into the New Democrats, but a lot of Barack Obama's policies are moderate. And so another question to ask when we're trying to figure out if liberalism or conservative, conservatism has, has a, had a bit of bigger impact is to think about how Barack Obama fits into that shift um, of the Democratic Party that we call the New Democrats, the more moderate uh, Democratic Party that almost looks like moderate conservatism. Um, is Barack Obama a break away from that or does it fit neatly into people like like Bill Clinton. And finally, think about how Donald Trump fits into the modern, uh, history of modern conservatism. How would you think about him in relation to someone like Ronald Reagan? Uh, 
How does he fit in with someone like George W. Bush, right? Does he fit neatly into the story of, of modern conservatism or is he a completely different animal, right? It's really important to um, asking uh, about the impact of modern conservatism since World War II.